VH1's recipe for a hit 80s metal band. Take one case of hairspray. Practically a can in each hand. Add enough makeup to make Tammy Faye Baker proud. I was wearing pretty much more makeup than my mom was at the time. And now you've got hair metal. It was the look and sound you couldn't escape. For the band, it was a dream come true. I remember dropping the phone and yeah. screaming. <laughs> <laughs> what? These days, some are looking back. Well, there's a lot of rock star wannabes out there. And I'm glad to say that I'm a used to be. Most are looking forward. I have a beautiful wife, a beautiful son. And a few are still partying like it's 1989. I did 21 shows in a 24-hour period. From the scary to the sweet, you've got them all on VH1's Where Are They Now? Metal Mania. They are the band who named themselves after germ warfare. They were the guys who moshed when slam dancing was the order of the day. Along with Megadeth and Metallica, Anthrax were one of the first bands to fuse the anger of punk with the crunch of heavy metal. You're anti, you're anti Despite lack of radio play and little press, fan word of mouth earned Anthrax a huge headbanging following all over the world. In Europe, it was insane. I remember us being in a taxi on our way to the gig in Milan. Oh my yeah. god! And we're pulling in, we're, we're pulling into this parking lot, and there's hundreds of kids started running after the car. They surrounded the car, started rocking it. So finally, we got out, and they were ripping our hair and like kissing us. In certain places in Europe, they're just really emotional. I to score their first hit, I'm the Man, the band mixed heavy metal with Hebrew. We took the, the riff from that Jewish folk song, Hava Nagia. The lyrics for this platinum seller were inspired by the Rodney Dangerfield film, Easy Money. We just love that movie, and Frankie was always yelling that, you know, from that scene. I'm the man, come down. Come down! I'm the man! I'm so bad, I should be in detention. In 1991, they launched another unusual collaboration, teaming up with Chuck D and Flava Flav of Public Enemy. I always wanted to do a rap song again because I'm the man, which is so killer. I said, I have this riff, just put down a beat to it, you know, put down some kind of groove, and I want to do Bring the Noise. And then we contacted Chuck, and uh, initially he said no, and then we set it on the track, and then they called back up and said, This is killer. Killer it was. Anthrax received a Grammy nomination for Bring the Noise. Later that year, the two bands broke down musical and racial barriers by touring together. In 1992, Anthrax went Hollywood, dropping in on the Bundys on TV's Married with Children. They wrote this script called My Dinner with Anthrax. She called us and said, they want you to do it. And I, I remember dropping the phone and yeah. screaming at the top of my <laughs> What? Wow. The desolation. It's not totally empty. It's a chia pet in there. <laughs> uh, that, that's not a chia pet. Uh, that was a meatloaf. The hardworking group was enjoying increasing success, but musically they felt they had hit the wall. The band felt it was time to bid farewell to vocalist Joe Belladonna. I was cool with it, you know. It was sad to, sad to say goodbye unwillingly, you know. A lot of people actually thought I quit. And I just felt like we needed to move on. It needed to change. It wasn't a personal thing. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like we hated each other. It wasn't anything like that. For me, it really came down to just where I was at in my head creatively. Anthrax brought in Armored Saints vocalist John Bush as his replacement. I got a chance to start making some money, and that's kind of was an unusual uh, development in my rock and roll career. Wow, I have actually some money and I could actually go and buy some drinks for everybody. In 1995, second guitarist Dan Spitz quit the group. Today, he's recording new music with old buddy Joe Belladonna while making a living as a watchmaker. As a little kid, uh, I grew up, my grandfather used to teach me since I'm around 11, 
um, how to repair watches. So it was always a, a, an interest for me to go back to that someday. Anthrax found themselves doing the record company shuffle, passing through two labels in two years. In 1996, this gold and platinum selling band were without a record contract. So where are Anthrax now? Scott Ian did some time in jail. In 1997, the inebriated guitarist broke into the Yankee Spring training camp and tried to steal a Yankees logo circle. He found Florida police waiting to take him away. Of course, the whole thing was funny, you know, and you know, great. I mean, nobody got hurt or anything, you know, like that. But uh, it cost me a lot of money for a lawyer, <laughs> you know, to, to defend it because I really picked on the wrong guy. Somewhere in my drunken state, I should have thought, like, you know, if you get in trouble, George Steinbrenner is the wrong guy to screw around with. Scott was charged on two felony counts of burglary and grand theft. Fortunately, shock jock Howard Stern came to the rescue. Howard Stern ended up having me and George Steinbrenner on his, on his show. And uh, I got to apologize personally to George Steinbrenner. And like two weeks later, they dropped the charges against me. In 1999, Anthrax inked a new record deal and is gearing up for a new album. These are my guitars. It only has five strings because I'm generally a rhythm guitar player and I find the, the high E and the B to be kind of superfluous. I never even use them. Whenever we feel uninspired or anything, we just look at this picture and boom, write another song. They also have a special world tour in the works. Half of the show is the old lineup with Joey. We're doing the old songs. Um, second half of that will be with John Bush. 16 years of thrash behind them, Anthrax had no intention of slowing down. All you can do is keep going. If you Stay love what strong. you do, you just got to keep going, and that's it. You have no choice. You know, it's either that or quit, you know? I mean, we don't want to quit, so. Quitting's for, no, I can't say it to be politically incorrect. Yeah. Miami is renowned for many types of music. Hard driving rock and roll is not one of them. Miami's hard rock scene was so small that the four members of Saigon Kick got together for one simple reason. We were the only ones left who couldn't get in any other bands. Like, you know, so it was a choice of either tolerating each other and putting a band together or, you know, not being in a band. Together, these leftovers of rock created a unique musical vision one that combined elements of metal, punk, and the burgeoning alternative scene. Because we came up in an isolated scene, we weren't in LA, we weren't in New York, <clears throat> and we were straddling the beginning of alternative and the end of metal, we were kind of pioneering, we were kind of the Magellans of a new way. Saigon Kick was well received in their native state, getting especially good notices from a young music writer named Brian Warner, who you may know better as Marilyn Manson. In 1990, Saigon Kick went national with their self-titled debut album. Their sound, however, remained undefined. One week we'd be getting uh, an offer to go out with Slayer, and the next week it'd be Cheap Trick. Then we went out with the Ramones. The band went to Stockholm to record their second album, The Lizard, which spawned their career-launching hit, Love is on the Way. Love is In December of 1992, The Valid went to number 12 on Billboard's Hot 100. But before the band could say sophomore jinx, lead singer Matt Kramer quit the band. I think we were still on the charts when I left, and I said, this is great. It, it's been a great ride. Before this gets really bad, before it gets tacky, I'm out. It's no really brilliant story here that's unlike anybody else's. I mean, band gets hit band decides they don't like to be with each other. Everybody decides they're the next, you know, genius, and everybody goes off in their own area to uh, find out whether they are or not. So where are the guys from Saigon Kick now? Jason Beeler got together with former extreme bassist Pat Badger and formed a new band, Super Trans Atlantic. Their song Super Down is featured on the soundtrack to 1999's American Pie.
in early 2000, Super Transatlantic will be releasing their debut album, Shuttlecock. Just the fact that DJs all over the country will be saying Shuttlecock at drive time. Isn't that an accomplishment in and of itself? Bassist Tom Defile toyed around with another band, Left for Dead, until he found his true calling, well, callings. Certified personal trainer, uh, licensed mortgage broker, licensed to do life and health insurance, actually did some studying uh, in a religious manner for uh, priesthood in the Wicca religion. Is that voodoo? No. Witchcraft. Is it? Yeah. Oh, a satanic priest. No. It's all about white magic. White not, magic. Not black magic. He's going to put a hex on me. No wonder why my foot hasn't been working for the last three months. Second bassist Chris McLernan is the president of a cellular communications company and is writing a book about the music industry. As for drummer Phil Verone, he needed to take some time off. I just kind of, you know, quit music in general for about a year and a half or so. So he opened a chicken wing shop in Terre Haute, Indiana. Phil and original Saigon kick singer Matt Kramer have returned to music in a band called Soul Star. I'm the lead singer. Phil's back on drums and, uh, and the chemistry's there, you know, it, it's just, it's like getting an old lover back in bed after years. You just know what buttons to push and, and, and he's even cuter. Coming up, Striper's Michael Sweet says to hell with hairspray. It was Aquanet extra super hold, of course. Trickster takes advantage of the land of opportunity. It's the American dream. You can do anything. And you get to have lots and lots of sex. And tough make a laundry list for rock and roll stardom. Drugs, 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 liquor, drugs, girls, whatever. Next on VH1's Where Are They Now? Metal Mania. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll may be the calling card of many a rock musician, but Christian metal band Striper had different goals. I've made the decision to go out and, uh, and make a stand for something different. And, you know, to, to run from the temptations instead of run to the temptations. Originally a generic metal outfit called Rock Regime, the band, brothers Michael and Robert Sweet, Oz Fox and Tim Gaines became Born Again in 1983 and changed their tune. Striper is an acronym for Salvation through Redemption, Yielding Peace, Encouragement, and Righteousness. And then if you ever saw the name Striper, you always saw Isaiah 55. By his stripes, his, his lashings that he took, we are healed. Even a Christian metal band needs an image. And the boys in Striper decided that dressing like glam rock bumblebees was just the ticket. We couldn't find anything yellow and black at the time, so we bought white and black and we dyed them yellow. Though Striper refrained from the evils of booze and pills, the band shared a vice common among their heavy metal peers, hairspray. Practically a can in each hand, you know, uh, and just every five minutes going back and putting more on. You know? It was unbelievable, and it was Aquanet Extra Super Hold, of course. Instead of guitar picks or t-shirts, these Rockers for Jesus pelted their audience with a different kind of memento, Bibles. Robert would come off the drums, and, and we would all go out and, and throw these Bibles out, and people would go crazy, crazy. The whole crowd would just, ah, you know, trying to get a Bible. Despite fans like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, the first hard rock band with a Christian message faced resistance from many of their church-going peers. Some people thought we were actually satanic, you know, and uh, because of they felt we were being, uh, you know, blaspheming God uh, with the hair and the look and the, and the sound. After two gold-selling releases in 1986, their third album, To Hell with the Devil, went platinum. The top 30 single honestly put Striper on the map. At one point, the video was the most requested on MTV, beating out Poison, Motley Crue, and Bon Jovi. In 1991, Michael Sweet left the band. Later that year, the rest of Striper went their separate ways. 
So where are Striper now? Singer Michael Sweet has moved his family from Los Angeles to Cape Cod. He helps his wife run their family business, Maple Park Campgrounds. Ranger Mike is what everyone calls me around here. And uh, I drive a Jeep around, and, and basically my role here is to make sure all the campfires are out. Uh, I show people to their sites and where their hookups are, uh, deliver messages, uh, fill propane tanks, uh, eat a lot of ice cream. Ranger Mike is also Farmer Mike. They have cranberry uh, business as well, and they have 11 bogs, and, and I help with that as well. So I put on hip waders and get out in the water, and you go out there and you corral these, these berries that are floating on the water in, and you use these rakes. That's something else I do. I mow the ball field. <laughs> the former Striper lead singer has not given up music entirely. He just finished recording his third solo album, Truth. The remaining members of Striper continue to pursue music. Brother Robert Sweet is working on a solo record. By day, Oz Fox works in an audio equipment distributor. So basically, you've got, uh, you've got lift capabilities to go up and down racks. By night, he and Tim Gaines inspire local fans with their band, Sin Dizzy. Invited to play a reunion gig in Puerto Rico in 1999, Striper found out that outside their home turf, they could still pack a stadium. You know, and then when we pulled into the shell, it looked like, looked like a football game. And I thought, what is this? And the guy said, that's where you're playing. I said, you're kidding me. Just the sea of people. So will the band reunite to spread its message of the father, the son, and the holy hairspray in the 21st century? And I look back at some of the pictures now, and it's just a riot. You know, I'm in tears because the hair is so big. And it's like, how did we get our hair that big? I would suppose if we ever reunited, it has to be before we all lose our hair, right? <laughs> One thing's for sure, the former members of Striper haven't lost their faith. Jesus to be there for each and every one of you. 1985, Tough were aspiring rockers barely older than their teenage audience. We would go to bars and they'd be, first off, you're 18, you can't even drink, uh, let alone come into the bar and play. Todd Chase on, George DeSaint and Michael Lean got their break and they opened up for Poison in their hometown of Phoenix, Arizona. At this point we had fully glammed ourselves up and uh, I was wearing pretty much more makeup than my mom was at the time, you know. Uh, and we did the show with Poison, and they said they were super guys. And except for when Bobby Dahl slept with my girlfriend. Outside of that, they were pretty wonderful fellas. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you got to come to L.A. You're not going to get recognized in Phoenix. Come to L.A. After hitting L.A., they picked up vocalist Stevie Rochelle, a dead ringer for Poison's Brett Michaels. We went and met with him and said, who cares if he can sing? He looks good. After three national tours, the band landed a record deal with Atlantic in 1991. They made one video, I Hate Kissing You Goodbye, and success was theirs. I believe we got up to number three on MTV's yeah. Top Most Wanted. Tough rode the crest of the pop metal wave. They hung out with Gene Simmons. He's looking up to Kiss, and next thing you know, you're eating popsicles at his house. They indulged their vices. Drugs, 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 liquor, drugs, girls, whatever. Their fun was interrupted when the rental van was robbed and torched in Tennessee. Remember walking through the projects just going, all right, who's got our gear? We're four white guys in the middle of the projects in Memphis. We want our gear. And they're all wearing our t-shirts, you know. They go, I don't, I don't know anything about it. By 1995, it was all over. So where are tough now? Drummer Michael Lean is married, has a son, and went into business for himself. He owns the old New York bagel shop in Camarillo, California. The bagel business, full of holes. <laughs> <laughs> we own a bagel and deli business, and uh, so far it's gone very well. It's, you know, we're looking to open more stores, hopefully in, in the near term. Bassist Todd Chason leads a band in L.A. called Substance D. It's almost like reliving tough again. 
but just without the makeup. Wisconsin native Stevie Rochelle has a Green Bay Packers fan band called CWA, Cheeseheads with Attitude. The pack is back, let's hear a cheer. Go back, go! The green, the gold, the cheese, or Milwaukee beer. They are a hot item at bowling alleys and tailgate parties during football season. When he's not busy in front of a mic, Stevie's busy in front of a camera as a bit player in a variety of movies. And I, I, you know, I always get a phone call here and there that somebody goes, hey, I was watching cable and I seen this goofy movie and, and I was just wondering if this was you. With 80s nostalgia in full bloom, will the group ever join the reunion bandwagon? Bon Jovi probably lived out some dreams, or Guns N' Roses or Motley Crue, I mean, selling 30 or 40 million records. But I really don't think that there's ever the, the possibility of a full-blown tough reunion just because of the fact that, you know, honestly, we weren't that big of a band. Coming up, what made Faster Pussycats Greg Steele a shut-in? I stayed home for about three years and never left the house, basically. Trickster's Mark Scott on Life After Big Hair. Didn't even recognize me. I mean, I lived with the guy for years on a bus and all over America. Kid didn't even see me. And what heavy metal stud had quite an effect on the Cherry Pie Girl? I haven't dated in five years. Want to find out where your favorite artists are now? Write us at VH1's Where Are They Now? 1633 Broadway, 5th Floor, New York, New York, 10019. Or email us at vh1.com, AOL keyword VH1. Amy Guaranello from Philadelphia writes, when are you going to do an episode with my all-time favorite band, Jackal? I just love to sing along really loud to push comes to shove, but only if I'm alone in my car. You need to tell me, where are they now? Well, Amy, Jackal recently made music history. Find out how next on VH1's Where Are They Now? Metal Mania. Amy Guaranello from Philadelphia writes, When are you going to do an episode with my all-time favorite band, Jackal? I just love to sing along really loud to push comes to shove, but only if I'm alone in my car. You need to tell me, where are they now? Here's the story. Jackal formed in 1990, the time when most metal bands were taking a back seat to the alternative rock scene. Their 1992 debut album went platinum on the strength of such songs as I Stand Alone and The Lumberjack, in which lead singer Jesse James Dupree made a solo appearance with a chainsaw. I've heard of other bands that, that, that played with a chainsaw, you know, play around with it. I mean, we, I mean, we actually incorporate it to be the musical instrument that it is. They would follow that up with a 1994 gold-selling release, Push Comes to Shove. When push comes to shove push Success continued throughout the mid-90s with their appearance on the platinum-selling Beavis and Butthead Experience and a gold record for the concert album, Woodstock 94. So where are they now? In the Guinness Book of World Records, in 1998, they set out to break George Thorogood's record of performing 50 shows in 50 days. Upping the ante, they decided to try for 100 shows in 50 days, and their fans were along for the ride. We pull into town at 5 o'clock in the morning. There's, you know, 3,000 people camped out already in this parking lot. Breaking the world record forced them to fudge the rules a bit. Instead of moving to different venues, Jackal stayed put and just swapped audiences. We actually stopped in Abilene, Texas and did 21 shows in a 24-hour period. The grueling pace began to take its toll on the band. We had to send out for super glue, and they were, you know, where the, the strings had made indentions into the calluses and into their fingers. They're filling them with, with the super glue, you know, and trying to get it dry in time for us to get back out there and play again. But Jacko persevered, ending their record-breaking tour in Macon, Georgia, home of the Allman Brothers, Little Richard, and Jesse James Dupree. Show number 100 goes to Macon, Georgia, my home state. Gotta love it, gotta love it. The last show, uh, it was, it was, it was you, you get an understanding of what Jerry Lewis feels like at the end of his telephone. 
As holders of the New World Performance Record, Jesse has some advice for other acts waiting in the wings. If you feel like you're the band, and you are the band, and jump on that wagon and ride, Jack. But until then, we are the bull of the woods. Ha! If you will. Trickster, Mark Scott, Steve Brown, Pete Lauren, and P.J. Farley, four guys from Paramus, New Jersey. Basically, it was friends who grew up together, started a band. The first gig we ever played was at my middle school, where my, uh, my father is, was the principal, if you can believe that. Taking inspiration from both their musical heroes and female fans, Trickster had big hair. It was just something to swing around, you know, really more than anything. And uh, I got back problems from that. By 1989, when bassist P.J. Farley was still in high school, the band was signed to a record deal. In 1990, their hit Give It To Me Good made the charts. One of the perks of stardom was touring with their idols, Kiss. Kiss and Van Halen were the reasons that this band ever existed, that Trickster ever started. Getting a call from Kiss was one of the biggest things in my life. Uh, it was a band that we all looked up to, and it gave us another opportunity to play the Meadowlands. And to finally go out on the road with them and to hang out with Gene every night, which is, you know, comedy in itself, it was great. Like kids in a candy store, the guys of Trickster had their pick of vices. I chose to stay away myself, at least from the drugs. Sex was a different story. Next question. A lot of people, a lot of places, a lot of beer, a lot yeah. of pizza. You know, it was right. cool. A lot of chicks. Success, however, was fleeting. By the time a second LP here was released in 1991, Pop Metal was out. We would go to radio with our first single off that second record and program directors would be like, we just changed our format yesterday. So where are Trickster now? Singer Pete Lauren has a new house and a new life in Arizona. You find all sorts of Native American history things, ancient uh, Indian, Indian mask here. Isn't that something? He satisfies his musical urge by playing the local club circuit. Here we go. And on the wall, when all is gone, you might have your own. But all in all, you might have to take. Drummer Mark Scott runs an indoor amusement center near his hometown in New Jersey. Hey, you having a good time? I'm currently the director of marketing. It's a great gig. I love it. Uh, it's a little different as far as what I used to do. I love it. A new look and very different priorities has put some distance between Mark and his former bandmates. I remember just a couple of months ago, walking through the mall, I saw PJ pass by, and he passed me right next, shoulder to shoulder. Didn't even recognize him. I mean, I lived with the guy for years on a bus and all over America. Kid didn't even see me. I almost didn't recognize him too, because he looks a lot different than I do. The former drummer has no regrets about leaving the roar of the crowd behind. Well, there's a lot of rock star wannabes out there, and I'm glad to say that I'm a used to be. Steve and PJ have held on to their musical aspirations and have a new band, Soap. We're just working. We're two musicians. This is what we do. We have no options. <laughs> These longtime friends are happy to have had their ride on the Rock Star Express. It's the American dream. You can do anything. And you get to have lots and lots of sex. Coming up, guitar hero Ingve Malmsteen gets in trouble with the law. So I go outside in my robe, and somebody comes with a, with a 12 gauge on face and goes, like, Get on the ground, you know? I'm like, Huh? And Faster Pussycat crosses the line. It's kind of freaky. I felt bad about sticking it down my pants. The year was 1988, and this star of Warren's Cherry Pie video was every teen boy's wet dream come to life. Find out where this heavy metal hottie is now, next on VH1's Where Are They Now? Metal Mania. Davies Metal was about pretty boys with guitars and the even prettier girls in their videos. She's my 
Bobby Brown was the most famous video babe of them all. To this day, people will be like, hey, Cherry Pie Girl. Growing up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Bobby Brown got her start in local beauty pageants. Miss Teen USA for Louisiana is contestant number 14, Miss Bobby Jean Brown. Before she starred in videos by Warren and Great White, she hooked up with another big show biz player, Ed McMahon. I won 13 episodes on Star Search, which is more than uh, any other contestant, which is good, but I lost the final episode. Our TV spokesmodel grand champion is Debbie. <laughs> I didn't win the 100 fan, but I got a lot of recognition. Among those who recognized her from Star Search was Warren's lead singer, Jamie Lane. I was dating Matthew Nelson at the time, and he went on Howard Stern and was like, I don't care, Matthew, I'm in love with Bobby. He was just straight up, I'm in love with this girl. And I thought, you know, that's cool. The two were soon married and had a daughter. Divorced two years later in 1993, Bobby moved in with one of her ex-husband's rivals, Motley Crue drummer Tommy Lee. A year later, she had him arrested on charges of domestic abuse. It was ugly for a while. It was ugly, but we're friends now. I mean, we don't hang out, we don't call each other and go, hey, you wanna go get coffee? To make matters worse, Bobby found she had an X-rated impersonator out to steal her thunder. There is a girl who is a stripper, and she uses my name, Bobby Brown. She would go out, use my poster, sign my name, and be Bobby Brown. She was in Penthouse used my name in Penthouse. So I sued her and the company, and their company, because of all the work that I lost for her pretending to be me. And what's sick about it is she claimed my family. She said she was married to Jane, and she would tell people, oh, Taylor's doing fine. I mean, that got crazy. In 1994, Bobby Brown won her lawsuit. So where is Bobby Brown now? After taking some time off to raise her daughter, Bobby graduated from music videos to TV shows. She's a regular on a new series called Battle Dome. Battle Dome is going to be the most exciting sports show on TV. In the spirit of American Gladiators, Battle Dome is athletic competition spiced up with a lot of show business. Legapus has been getting hammered. Watch. Oh, he got nailed again in the back of the head. Legapus seems to be getting the worst of it. My character name on Battle Dome is called Bobby Haven. Yeah, original Miss B. Haven. In 1999, this former serial rocker chick offers some words of caution to women wanting to date their musical idols. To not take your head off and put theirs on. You know, you don't have to change you to please other people. Will we see the still luscious Bobby on the arms of a 90s pop star anytime soon? Do I date musicians? No. Taking their name from a Russ Meyer B movie, Faster Pussycat sprang onto the LA club scene in 1985. They achieved widespread success when their second album, Wake Me When It's Over, went gold on the strength of the single, House of Pain. As they climb the charts, Faster Pussycat hit the road. We were on tour with Mother Crew and had a, like a top 30 single. And I mean, that was like, you know, for us, I mean, a band like us, like, that was just like, whoa. Touring had its ups, downs, and unexpected surprises. Lead singer Tammy Down remembers one concert particularly well. People are sticking their hands up in the crowd. And Brent had apparently pulled off a prosthetic arm. I'm like, oh, cool, a prop. I thought it was just somebody's toy. And I grabbed it from him and started like scratching my ass and my privates with it. And then I see this girl, like, she's like almost like crying, going, no, no. It was like, actually a real prosthetic arm. I felt bad about sticking it down my pants. Seeing no end to the glam metal phenomenon, singer Tammy Down and MTV VJ Ricky Rackman opened a club called The Cat House on Sunset Strip. But soon, the musical spotlight moved away from LA, up north to Seattle. The band's third album, Whip, entered the charts at number 90 and then quickly fell into oblivion. And so did Faster Pussycat. In 1994, the group broke up.
We crumbled and fell apart in the dirt. For guitarist Greg Steele, the breakup of the band was a low point. It's kind of like you, you got picked up in a tornado, you got spun around for six years and dropped down in the same spot that you were in. You're just kind of like, you know, excuse me. Shoot, what am I supposed to do now? So where a faster pussycat now? Guitarist Greg Steele sank into a three-year rut. I stayed home for about three years and never left the house, basically. Um, and then I started working. I just like had no money. I'm like, I gotta get a job doing something. So this is a new 1999 Faster Pussycat, whatever you Nobody looks a little bit different, but. Greg found work as an audio engineer at Fox TV in Los Angeles, but he has not left his musical aspiration behind. The band I have called Zodiac, and it's kind of electronic, kind of electronic techno dance type stuff. It's kind of out there. The other members of Faster Pussycat haven't strayed too far from the LA music scene either. Guitarist Brent Muscat and bassist Eric Stacy have joined ex-LA Guns lead singer Philip Lewis in the band Philip Lewis and the Liberators. Singer Tame Me Down is co-owner and promoter of Pretty Ugly, a night of glam rock at the LA club The Dragonfly. That's basically a place where people can come see good live bands, hang out, have drinks and party with it. It's like a once a week party. He is also busy with his current musical incarnation, The Newly Deads. Years after his band has left the spotlight, Faster Pussycat's former frontman is one 80s rocker who has successfully avoided the 9 to 5 drag. I sleep between 9 and 5. I'm a vampire. That's what happens when you promote clubs and DJ and you don't get the sunlight and the pasty skin. Coming up, guitar god Ingve Malmsteen shares his recipe for success. You can shred lettuce, shred cheese, you can shred potatoes. <laughs> I shred guitar strings. Next on VH1's Where Are They Now? Metal Mania. Guitar heroes all have their distinct signature styles, but few are more unique than Sweden's Ingve Malmsteen. Coming to LA in 1983 with only his guitar and an extra pair of jeans, the 19-year-old Ingve's clean, fast, classical-influenced style soon became all the rage. I remember when I came to LA and all these guys come up and dude, you shred, dude. You shred, dude. I'm like, huh? Dude, what's that, you know? You can shred lettuce, shred cheese, you can shred potatoes. <laughs> I shred guitar strings. He was soon shredding with his own band, Rising Force. In 1985, they were nominated for a Grammy for Best Rock Instrumental. When I announced it, is that the nominees are Jeff Beck and Steve Ray Vaughan and Ying Yang or Yong Wee Malmsteen or something like that. I said, OK, I know I'm not going to win it. <laughs> However, his career rise would take a fall. In 1987, a near-fatal car crash put Ingve in a coma for a week and severely damaged nerves in his right hand. The accident was just the beginning of a year of bad luck. I found out my manager had ripped me off all my money. I had no money. Then, you know, I'm, I, my house was destroyed in an earthquake. Then the absolute worst thing that ever could happen, my mother passed away. Ingve began to pick at his guitar strings again, and after a miraculous recovery, he released his seventh LP, Odyssey, with its single, Heaven Tonight. Everything healed. My playing was actually better than before. Career problems were soon compounded by personal troubles. In 1993, his girlfriend's mother had him arrested on charges of kidnapping. She called the cops and she said that I was kidnapping her daughter. So I wake up like, you know, oh, what's going on? You know, like, like, come out with your hands up, bullhorns and helicopters. And they cut off all the streets and you know, this SWAT team climbing on the house and it's like a movie. So I go outside in my robe 
And somebody comes with a, with a 12 gauge in my face and they're like, get on the ground, you know? He was in the press before, like that. His girlfriend denied the charges and the case was dismissed. So where is Ingve now? Today, Ingve is living the good life in Florida with a new wife, a collection of guitars, exotic cars, and other unusual toys. It's made for me, it's actually, I can actually wear it. He is grooming his son Antonio to follow in his footsteps. Before he was born, I had Fender make him uh, Antonio Mountain model since they make my mold. It's a little guitar. Yeah. But he prefers the big ones. With 18 rock albums behind him, Ingve fulfilled a lifelong dream in 1997 by composing a concerto with electric guitar as the lead instrument. I mean, it's nothing rock about it. It's completely, I mean, if you didn't know, if it wasn't electric guitar playing, you would probably think it was Vivaldi or Bach or something. The guitarist has released instructional videos and his groundbreaking technique has spawned legions of musical wannabes. Hi, welcome to the video. My name is Ingve Malmsteen, J Malmsteen by the way, yeah. Okay, this is the fingering for A minor. I find it very uh, kind of frustrating to try to teach because they will say like, can you play that slow? And I, I, okay, I go, okay, here it is, blah, blah, blah. No, no, play it slow, that was slow, I think. <laughs> You do that very slow, it goes. With a 1999 album, Alchemy, in stores and a tour in the works, the fast-playing, fast-driving Swede is not one to reminisce about the past. I've never felt so content and so happy with how things are going as I do now. You know, I have a beautiful wife, a beautiful son. I have my own recording studio, you know. I mean, things, things are going really well for me. They were the bands who rocked our world from the Sunset Strip to the streets of Jersey. Yeah! These lanky leather boys thrashed us senseless with a sound strong enough for a man, but a look sweet enough for a woman. Dudes might not look like ladies anymore, but as long as there are loud guitars and smudge-proof mascara, hair metal will never die. See Skid Row, Def Leppard, Motley Crue, and Poison before they were rock stars. Tonight at 10, 9 central, only on Bad Boys Week. Only on VH1. Tragic.